Excellent. Thanks again, Ryan. Hey, everyone. Thank you again for spending another Friday afternoon with uh, myself and my colleagues. Uh, my name is Paul Azzi, a cybersecurity TSA. Um, I work in the security arena with Cisco. I've been doing this for a long, long time. Um, I think a lot of people know me um, over, the, uh, over the years. Uh, today, I support uh, global enterprise accounts uh, in the Texas, Louisiana area. But once upon a time, I, I did cover a bigger patch and uh, across the U.S., and once upon a time, I also covered a global patch uh, working with the high-touch delivery team uh, here at Cisco. Uh, today's session is what is new in Firepower 6.6. Uh, we're going to be spending the next hour going through some of the, the features, some of the, the cool stuff. There's no way we're going to cover everything in one hour, so I've put a short list of things we will be covering. But to that point, please post any and all questions into the Q&A uh, window. We've got a couple of panelists who I'm going to let introduce themselves in just a few seconds here, uh, uh, answer these questions. And uh, the goal is to allocate about 10 or 15 minutes uh, towards the end of the session for live Q&A. So again, please ask uh, any and all questions that come to mind. Uh, please be uh, aware that I also will be asking questions in some cases to see if uh, uh, people can distinguish what's changed in the FMC over the years. Um, I'll call them out as we go through. Um, I'll be quiet. I'm going to uh, pass the microphone to uh, and work our way down the panelists. So, Ned, would you please introduce yourself? Thanks, Paul. Yep, so Paul and I are on the same team, and I'm a architect supporting uh, the south, southern part of the United States. Thank you. Uh, Ned, Ryan? I'm a security architect covering the north Texas area. Excellent. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, Mr. Joshua? I'm a TSA uh, security architect supporting South Florida. Thanks, Josh. And uh, Tom? Yep, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Tom Dixon. I'm um, actually Josh's counterpart covering North Florida. Nice. All right, guys, thank you again for uh, helping out with the Q&A. I certainly appreciate everyone's um, involvement and, and help. Um, anyone who has attended one of these fire, uh, Firepower Hour sessions in the past, um, there's n really not a lot of slides to go through. It's all, all demo-driven, all through showing, explaining exactly how to turn on the knobs and, and such. Now, with 6.6, .6, it's a little bit different because some things, there's really nothing to turn knobs on. It's just behind the scene. It's real hard to showcase some of those things. So we kind of omitted some of those features. But to that point, you should always go and look at what uh, the release notes um, have as far as what has changed in the 6.6 uh, 6, uh, code. I've put here bullets around some of the things I'd like to cover depending on time. Um, these are, in my opinion, things that we can demonstrate, we can talk about. Um, and certainly, uh, again, as I mentioned, please go look at the release notes. Uh, you don't have to memorize the URL, but if you can just Google 66 Firepower Release Notes, uh, it'll probably the first link will be the one that has all this um, information uh, readily available to you. Um, and then, um, as, as posted earlier, when you guys came on board uh, to the WebEx, um, we're always open to hear about your feedback uh, around what topics you guys would like to see showcased, uh, demoed, explained. Uh, please send us an email, um, as well as this recording and past previous recordings. They're all under my YouTube channel. Uh, the channel is the Power of Firepower, um, and if you get there and you land and you see a Ferrari F40, well, you've hit the right <laughs> channel. So with that, let me transition into my UI. And the first thing we'll talk about is I've logged on, and you're seeing a slightly different user interface. 
this is what we refer to as the light theme. So the, the, the difference between the light theme and the classic is functionality, it's, it's pretty much the same, but it's more of a softer, not as harsh, uh, not as a, a rigid looking as the previous. So with 6.5, um, it was an option to toggle back and forth with 6.6. Six. This is now the default. To, to toggle back to the classic, you simply go here to your, your name, and you can say switch the classic theme. When you click on the switch the classic theme, um, it'll take about um, a few seconds, and then it takes you right back to the FMC that we're all familiar with. That, a couple of things I'm going to call out. So what, one of my pet peeves with the classic, not, not that I dislike the FMC, uh, to the contrary, I really actually enjoy the FMC, but let's say I want to go to policies or, or analysis, and I go to analysis, and let's say I want to go look at my host, and as soon as I move away, if, if I deviate from the analyst uh, bar, uh, the whole thing collapses, right? So if I go back to my uh, light theme, again, it'll take a few seconds to transition back. One of the things that I like with the, this light theme is let's say I want to go to analysis, I click on it once, and then it opens it up as a pop-up, and now I'm free to navigate anywhere that I want to navigate without having to worry that this is going to collapse. And if I click on it again, it's going to close that, that pop-up. So again, if I want to go to overview, click on it. I'm going to go to policies, click on it. And then I can click on any policy or, or, or um, whatever link I want to click on to next. So this is the light theme. Um, notice that the configuration here is gone. So it's this little settings uh, cog. You click on this, and I can see my configuration, my users, my updates, my, my, my health-related um, events and policies, as well as the monitoring and the tools. And lastly, the licenses, right? So this is all encompassed underneath this uh, cog, which is now your uh, settings or the gear. Um, uh, guys, notice I've got this little I with the number two on top of that. Uh, that implies just two things for me to come and look at. Uh, let me click on that and notice that I've got um, a criticality under my health. Um, let's, let's look into that. So this is my FMC's host name. It's called FMC66. Um, Let me go back here. And, and the first thing I'm noticing here, it says insufficient RAM for my virtual FMC. It's set to 26.13 gigs. 20 gig is required with 32 gigs is recommended. So notice now the first thing that I'm getting is because I did not allocate 28 gigs of physical memory to my FMC, I'm getting this, uh, this criticality in my um, health, a uh, health event. Um, and it's actually saying 32 gigs or better. When I downloaded this OVA to set this up, um, it actually installs with 32 gigs of memory. So anyone who's running uh, a previous version uh, that you want to upgrade to 6.6, the key thing to call out with that is that the uh, pre-upgrade uh, checks looks at the physical memory allocated, and if you don't have the appropriate amount of RAM, you'll get a warning and it will fail. So in my case, I intentionally dropped this down to 26 gigs where I can still launch this, uh, but I wanted to generate this error so we can actually see what this would look like. So definitely, please note that the 6.6 does require 28 gigs or better uh, with 32 gigs or more uh, as to being the recommended. The second error message or the, the, the criticality here is that I'm using the SourceFire uh, legacy user agent, and it's calling out right here that it's being deprecated and will be removed in future releases. So anyone who's running with the uh, Cisco SourceFire user agent for identity mapping, that from, starting from 6.7 will be deprecated, and we will be moving on to ICE or ICE Passive Identity Connector, 
I speak for short as the identity source, right? So again, just calling it out that these are six, six uh, features that we're able to see here. Um, since we're under the, the system, uh, let's go look at a, a feature that I think is real useful. So I'm gonna go under users. And this feature is called the real names associated with FMC user accounts. So if I was to create a new user, um, I can specify what that username is and the password and whether we're using external auth because we've got integration with Active Directory. So let's say that this user is going to be Ryan, uh, or I'm gonna call it actually R first. But the real name, that's, that's the new um, uh, option now on their user account, and this allows me to actually type in the real name of the person. So this allows me to not only look at the username, but the actual name of the person. In some organizations, the username is, it could be an arbitrary value with numbers or, or, or a variety of, of string of characters, which is really meaningless from an audit perspective. But the fact that I've got the real name listed there allows me to correlate the username with the, the real person. Again, not a substantial change, but nonetheless something that will improve the audit logs from a, from a, a change management as well as knowing uh, who that person is uh, in relationship to the uh, uh, just the username. So let's cancel this and move on. So let's pivot and let's go look under our policies and from here I'm going to go to my access control. There's a lot of cool stuff that got added, modified into the uh, access control policy. So let's go ahead and edit the internet access policy that is applied to one firewall. And as this is loading, uh, this looks pretty traditional like most access control policies got rules and also I've got a few that are blocking application, uh, blocking URLs. Uh, this is blocking country code. Again, please don't take offense to this. This is just an example. Uh, this, are, this is uh, allowing some access to certain ports, some blocked ports. I'm not logging DNS. Uh, and then an interactive block, a rule for marketing, and then just allowing uh, different zones or different networks to communicate with one another. And I've got a variety of intrusion policies, um, malware policies. Um, so wh while we're here, the first thing I'll talk about is if, if I go to security intelligence, that tab, 6.6 six introduced some additional um, categories, both for the network and for the URL. So if I scroll down, um, I'll see the starting with the attackers. Um, I've got a, a few uh, additional SI categories, banking fraud, um, uh, the uh, high risk, indication of compromise, link sharing. Those are some of the couple uh, uh, network objects and I'm gonna have the same thing, the corresponding uh, URL um, objects uh, that are listed here. So. Anyone who's deployed security intelligence, whenever new categories are being added, they are not automatically added to your blacklist. So this is something you will manually have to add them. Um, crypto mining actually got added about 18 months ago, 24 months ago, and a lot of people set and forget their SI security intelligence. And one of the things we were telling our customers is please don't forget to periodically come back and check your security intelligence for new categories because when you're saying, I'm gonna add all of the above into my uh, blacklist and uh, something else gets added, well, it's not automatically gonna be added to your blacklist, right? So, so just note. So again, new categories under the SI. So let's go back to rules and let's talk about some of the enhancements that uh, that uh, allow me as a, as a network operator, security operator to come in here and filter a little bit easier. So let's say I wanna search on rules. So I'm gonna click on the search rules uh, filter bar and notice the first thing that I see, this is a very large comprehensive 
uh, pretty much every column that's available in a rule is listed here. So let's say I'm going to come in and I want to filter based on, I don't know, Corp and DMZ as a source, and I can actually click on the search. And what this is going to do, it's going to highlight uh, any and all rules that have the Corp and DMZ listed as the source, and I've identified nine uh, rules that match that criteria, and I could use the up down to highlight the the different rules that that light up, right? So I could use this to say here here they are. Um, if I want to edit that uh, search criteria, I can click here one more time, and now say maybe I'm looking for this, but I'm also looking for users that have marketing. So I'm going to type in MKTG, and let's go ahead and search. And this narrows it down. So the, the, needless to say, the fact that I typed in the second criteria, it became an and. So it's looking at DMZ or Corp or Corp, and in this case, I'm looking for marketing. So now I went from nine rules to only having one rule. So let me, let me cancel this out and show you one more time. So let's go back in and have a different search. I'm going to come in here and say, let's look for source network. Maybe I'm looking for management. Maybe I'm looking for anything that has DMZ, and anything that has Corp. Well, that's pretty much everything that I'm going to have from a rules perspective. Again, it's going to light up all nine. But maybe, so, so again, this is an or from, uh, from a, a, a query perspective. Show me anything that has management, anything that has DMZ, anything that has corp. Notice here it's, it's DMZ2, uh, rule number nine, um, from a source network perspective. But it, it lights it up because it matches DMZ, right? So this is or. But if I come in here and I say, well, let's look for anything that matches this and that matches a destination port of, I don't know, uh, I'm going to pick Telnet or, or, or uh, SSH or, or whatever, and let's search this, um, all of a sudden we only match this one rule, right? So uh, to match any one of the, the three source networks and this destination port. So, Great usability, right? So to me, this is a little bit easier. The second thing to talk about while we're here is um, I want to understand some of these objects. Where are these objects being used? So I can now right-click and from here click on Object Details. In this case, I've got four objects here. So let's go to Object Details. And it's going to enumerate those four objects for me. So now I could clearly see what the value is for those objects. If I wanted to edit these objects, well, historically, what I would have to do historically, and this is a pain in the tush, you know, right-click, go to Objects, go to my Object Management, go to my Network Objects, which is exactly what I was looking at, and from there, I'm going to edit which one, whichever one of these rules or, or the, the, these network objects I was wanted to, to modify. So going back here, I, I don't have to do that anymore. I could right-click and go to Object Details, and from here, I could actually edit this. So if Corp needed to have a different value, I can click on that pencil. It opens up in edit mode, and from there, I can go ahead and edit that network object. Perhaps I want to see where DMZ is being used. Notice this little binocular icon. Click on the binocular icon. It looks at that object, and that object is being is being used in my variable sets, in my access control policy, as well as my SSL policy. Right. So again, I can actually see where objects are being used. I could edit objects from here, and I could search from a variety of, of matching criteria. And this applies not only to the access control policy, but I can do the same thing for my pre-filter policy as well. So to me, this is a, a, a huge um, advantage in, in a, being able to filter and search and edit objects right from within the access control policy without having to navigate back to my object tab. The other thing I want to talk about is, so if, you, if we can co come back and look at these rules where I've got my corp out, DMZ out, DMZ2 out, and a few of these rules have 
um, both a file policy and malware policy. So let's say I wanted to modify bulk rules and do changes to multiple rules. Well, historically what you would have to do is edit that rule, do your change, save it, edit the next rule, do your change, save it. It is time consuming, also prone to human error. So one thing we can do is select multiple rules by holding the control key and say I'm going to select the next four rules as an example. And now I can right click and say edit. And now it opens up in the editor. So now I could come in here and maybe disable uh, the, the rules. Maybe I can come in here and change the action for the rules collectively, right, uh, across multiple rules simultaneously. Maybe I want to change the um, intrusion policy. Maybe I want to change the file policy. Maybe I want to change the logging, right, maybe log at the beginning or log at the end. So the, the whole point is I can do bulk edits to multiple rules simultaneously without having to edit each and every rule individually, saving it, and then moving on. Lord knows if you've created a new intrusion policy and you're saying, well, I want to use this one here instead of the default uh, balance that Cisco provides me, and you already had, uh, I don't know, uh, 75 rules using the balance Cisco provided IPS policy, that is a long and tedious task to go through and modify each and every one of those 75 rules to use your user-defined intrusion policy. This allows me to simplify that in two simple steps. Select all the rules, edit, and then with one action, one change, modify all the rules that would be using that uh, intrusion policy. The last thing to talk about while we're here is let me X out my filter and let's create a new rule. And let's say I want to create a rule that allowed access uh, or denied access between a specific time period, well now we've got the time range. So this time range can't, comes from the ASA, we've had this for a long time in the ASA, finally made its way down to the um, FTD. So from here I can click on the plus to add my own uh, time range value, uh, specify when it starts, if it, if it does end after a period of time, and then the recurring value or interval that it's going to have, whether it's daily, whether it's a specific range, uh, a, a, a sequential range, it's entirely up to you. Also, I can go to my, let me cancel this here, I could go to my object management and come down to my time range and do the same thing from here, predefine my, my values, and in this case, I created one called weekdays, created one called weekend, so when I go back to my rule, I could specify from the drop-down, uh, let's, let's use this for the weekends where maybe we want to block access to certain uh, categories, maybe access to resources, servers that are not accessible over the weekend, whatever, right? But now we could use the time ranges in our access control policy rules. Uh, again, mu and 6.6 makes makes our um, administration more granular in the capabilities that we can accomplish when it comes to um, access control policy. So I don't want to add this, I want to cancel that. And yes, I do want to cancel that. Perfect. Um, from here, let's shift and look at a couple of more things. So I'm going to shift from here and let's go to, um, let me cancel out my ACP, let me back out of here. And let's go to analysis, let's go look at my connection events. So another cool thing that changed here is the wildcard support when searching for connection as well as security events when we're looking at URLs specifically. So um, the, this is my connection events. Let me scroll over. I could see a variety of URLs that I've been surfing and going to. Um, so what I want to do is maybe I want to search and filter for a value. So how do we do this? There's a, a edit search. Right now we don't have any constraints, so we're seeing everything. I'm going to click on edit the search. And let's say I want to search for um, Cisco, right? So uh, let's go down to the URL, which is what we're looking at, and I'm looking at explicitly that URL. 
So the first thing I'll tell you, um, not real intuitive, right? So if I want to simply search for Cisco.com, and I say go ahead and search for Cisco.com, uh, unfortunately it has to be an explicit match. And if it doesn't match explicitly, it comes back with no records found. So that's, that's a bit of a pain. So let me go back and re-edit that search. And what I'm going to do is put a star in front of Cisco.com. So I'm going to say, you know what, let's show me with a, this variable anything Cisco.com, and now let's search for that, and let's wait for this to, to parse through and, and filter. And we should get some hits once this refreshes. So we got a lot of hits. So let me scroll over and look at these URLs. So Cisco.com, which is exactly what I was looking for, right? I want to see who's going to Cisco.com. But notice that I've also got amp.cisco.com. I've got orbital.amp.cisco.com. I've got Cisco-tags.cisco.com. And do I have anything outside of Cisco.com? Well, look at here. I've got SanFrancisco.com. Um, that's, that's a lot of hits. I, I really don't care about anything outside of Cisco.com. So how would I just simply filter on Cisco.com? Let's go back and edit that uh, search one more time. And once this opens up the search, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say star dot Cisco. So now it's actually looking for anything dot Cisco. So it'll actually match AMP. It'll match um, it'll match uh, Orbital. So maybe I, I want to do this. Maybe I want to do star dot 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 dot, dot Cisco dot com. So now it could be whatever protocol, whatever. Um, actually, that's not what I wanted to do. Let me go back and just put the uh, omit the dub dub dub, and just put the uh, the star dot. That's what I meant to do. So uh, I, I want to look for anything matching Cisco.com. So that should remove that San Francisco.com for me. And anything Cisco.com, it'll match. Let's let this refresh and reload. Let me scroll over, and that should omit any and all SanFrancisco.com, and I'm not seeing any SanFrancisco.com listed anywhere. Perfect. So again, the, the searching capabilities, uh, now we could use the star as a wild card that allows me to filter, and that, that star could be used to uh, in a prepend or in an append. Uh, based on your search criteria. So going back to my search criteria, um, you can put that start at the beginning or at the end or both if you wanted to. Uh, one thing to call out here is how do you remove this? Well, you click on to show all the fields. So if you want to do multiple uh, queries, not only for the URL, don't forget that there's this option to click to show all fields. And now I could filter uh, a little bit more with more uh, uh, requirements or more conditions. So let's remove this and put it back the way it was. All right, so let's shift gears, and I want to shift and start looking at some of the new deployment options when it comes to um, the access control policy. So let's go back and go to deploy. And from here, let's go to deployment and let this open up. And it's going to say, well, I have got all my devices that are up to date, so it's, there's really nothing for me to deploy. So let's do this. Let's go to policies. I'll, I'll create a real quick change. I'll go to my malware and file policy. So I've got a policy called block malware. Let this load up. So let's go ahead and edit this. And what I'm going to do is I've only got one rule, which is looking at all the file types and I'm blocking if it's malware, right? So I'm going to add a rule which is not really malware dependent, so I don't care what application protocol, I don't care if it's an upload or download, um, I just want to detect the file. Don't, don't block it, detect means log, and I'm looking for multimedia file types, right, anything that's multimedia, at this, 
and store the file. So what, what in fact this does is it stores a copy of that file on the firewall. So this is a great way for me to augment and have a new MP3 collection without having to, just, just looking at files in motion, right? So let me go ahead and save this. So notice, again, detect files, it's just logging it, not, not doing anything outside of logging, but it will store the file. Anything that's multimedia, that whether it's upload or download, it's on the network. So let me save this. So because this is actually used in my access control policy, if I go to deploy, there will be changes, and now it should prompt me with the ability to deploy. So let's expand this, and the first thing to call out is I want to see, right? Show me the policies that have been modified. And here it is, that file policy block malware. So I can actually see what policy got modified out of all my policies. The next thing is I want to preview what changed. So let's click on the preview. It should come back and show me all the policies that have changed. And anything that's green has been added. Anything in blue has been added. Anything red has been removed. So I edited my block malware policy. Here's the timestamp, right? And then here's exactly what has been added. That's green. It's been added, right? So that's, that's exactly what we just did. The second thing I want to do is right here, it's what we call the selective policy selection. In some cases, when you go to deploy, it, there's dependencies and you have to deploy everything. In other cases, that's not the case. So I just clicked on this, it's thinking, and if I can deploy a file uh, or a policy that's independent from deploying the entire access control, it'll prompt me with the ability to do that. And here it is. I don't have to deploy the entire access control policy. I can do a selective deploy to only deploy this policy. So here's my question. Anyone remembers the last time we were able to do selective deployments? What Firepower version was that? And better yet, in what version did we have to push everything? When, when did that change? So when was the last time we were able to deploy individual policies? And when did it become all or nothing? Uh, and now in 6.6, it's breaking it up again. So please put your answers in the Q&A and we'll answer that uh, a little bit later. The other thing to call out from here, guys, is notice that this little estimate I can actually click on this. It's going to go through and gauge uh, approximately how much time it's going to take. In this case, it says it, it thinks it's going to take about three minutes, and then I can go ahead and deploy that policy, right? So to me, this is a nice new feature, uh, not to mention I can go to deployment and go to deployment history, and I can view successful, uh, failures, who's the person to logged on, um, expand the job, and from here, see the transcript of what was deployed, what changed, what was happened, right? So I can actually see um, a variety of which policy, what's changed, and what did I push, right? So I, I like this. I like the fact that we've got some audit into the policy deployments. I like that a lot. So while that's being deployed, let's go and look at a couple more things. The, the, the one thing I'll go to is let's go to devices, and I'm going to go to device management, and let's look at our VRF light. So anyone who's worked with um, routers, switches, being able to configure uh, virtual routing and forwarding is a nice feature to provide routing isolation, uh, run multiple routing tables, and you isolate instances for one from the other. Finally, this made its way to FTD. So let's go ahead and edit the firewall. And you'll notice that when you edit, there is a routing tab. So I'm going to go to my routing tab and you will have your global uh, VRF. And from there, you can create your VRF instances, assign your interfaces to your VRF instances, and uh, be able to, to deploy your 
uh, as an example, maybe we've got overlapping IP addresses, whatever the case might be, uh, you can uh, leverage VRF to uh, provide that isolation and routing. Uh, the other thing to call out with uh, VRF is that this is the VRF white, not full-fledged VRF, so there might be some limitations. And the other thing to call out is all the platforms of the FTD support VRF with the exception of the Firepower 1010 and the ISA 3000. The ISA 3000 is the industrial security appliance. It's the FTD that runs in a, a rugged um, form factor for um, uh, the I.O. business or the, uh, um, not I.O., but the O.T business where we can deploy this in uh, uh, environments that are uh, not typically conducive to standard normal firewalls or very ruggedized. So uh, both the ISA 3000 and the 1010 both do not support uh, uh, VRF flight. Um, and uh, anywhere between 5 to 100, depending on the hardware, depending on the platform that you're running, uh, we're going to have anywhere between 5 to 100 uh, VRF instances that are supported uh, in your, your platforms. Again, uh, when you go to the release notes, uh, there is a separate link that you click on. It takes you to the VRF um, section that uh, calls out the different platforms and the number of VRF instances that are supported in each and every one of those platforms. One more thing to talk about since we are here is when you go to your devices um, tab, uh, something called object group search. By default, it is disabled. So let me explain what OGS is. So when you do a access control policy rule, so I can go back and open up my ACP, and let's go look at my, um, let's go to policies, let's go to access control, and I'm going to edit my access control policy. Um, notice that I've got a whole bunch of rules that I've got multiple source networks or destination networks or a variety of uh, ports. So it's, it's one line, right? It's really one line, but I've got multiple objects. So what's going to happen is when this is uh, running in, 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 uh, on the firewall, this actually expands and uses memory. So what does this mean? So let, let's, let's look at this. Let, let's, FT, um, let's SSH into our firewall. So let's, let's uh, do this right here. So I'm going to log in as admin. Hopefully this is the right password. Perfect. So I'm going to do a couple of commands. So the first one is I want to see is um, object group search enabled. So I'm going to type in show running config object hyphen oops, object group search. Nothing comes back. That means it is not enabled. Next command is show access list. And here is my access control list. And if I scroll up, you can start seeing all my different entries, all my access control entries. If I scroll down and look at line 19, my access control entry, uh, not number uh, 19, all those networks are now expanding, right? The source and destination, they're, they're expanding. So that one line just became, uh, it looks like this is uh, 15, 16 lines that it created, and the same thing with line 20, and the same thing with line, well, you get the gist of it, right? So one entry actually starts expanding. Now what happens, this runs in memory. So um, object group search is a feature that's, I call it a trade-off. What, what do I mean by trade-off? Well, what I'm going to do is preserve my resources, my memory resources, and offload that to CPU, which means rather than having all these rules expanded, I'm going to have the CPU perform the query. So it's more taxing from a CPU pers perspective, 
but it alleviates the memory. So there's a lot of things that run in memory. So when you're running multiple intrusion rules, uh, it's going to expand the rule. It looks at uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, some of the content and puts that in memory so that when it's being evaluated against SNORT, it's able to match or disqualify the packet very quickly because it runs in memory. Um, and, and because of that, memory utilization can be high. So uh, all that to say is if your CPU is low but your memory is high, what you can do is offload performance, shift it from memory to CPU by enabling that feature. So let me, let me minimize this and return to my object and say let's go to object group search, let's edit this and I'm gonna enable object group search, but watch what happens when you enable this. Enabling object group search reduces memory requirements for access control policies that include network objects. However, object group search might also decrease rule lookup performance and thus increase CPU utilization. You should balance the CPU impact against reduced memory requirements for your specific access control policy. In most cases, enabling object group search improve, uh, provides a net operational improvement. Again, we're not telling you to go do this. Always understand the implication of uh, uh, performing higher CPU hit versus memory hit. So let me say okay, let me save, and just like everything else, it just needs to be deployed. So let's go and do a deployment. And from here I could see what exactly did change by clicking on the view. Here it is, the advanced settings under device configuration. I can tell you that this is not a selective deployment option. It has to deploy the whole thing. Let's go ahead and deploy. And while this is running, I'm going to return back to my uh, CLI, and let's go ahead and re-enable this. So let's go ahead and duplicate the session. And let's log back in. And as soon as the progress bar behind in the UI reaches 100%, we could reissue the same command, the uh, show running config, um, object group search, and we should confirm that it has been enabled, and then we will issue the uh, show access list command, and we'll see if it collapses all those entries. So let me go back here, and we're still at 8%. It'll take about two or three minutes to complete this deployment. While this is running, um, any anything worth bringing up uh, verbally, um, guys? Uh, no, I think Ned has uh, mostly nailed most of the questions in the in the queue, along with some of the other guys. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate it. So let me go ahead and right click and. Uh, one more time. There we go. It says complete. So let's log in. And it is show running config object group search. Now it is um, enabled, and let's do a show access list. Let's expand, and let's issue that one more time, actually, with the expansion. There we go. All right, so if I scroll up, um, notice that earlier under 19 and 20, we had um, 15, 16 entries. It's, it's taken that down to one. Here it is. It's actually referencing the object itself. It's no longer the individual objects, but the object group uh, collectively. So that means from a CPU perspective, we got to look up that object group and look at the members of that object group. 
uh, versus expanding it all and running all that in memory. So it does reduce the memory overhead. Uh, the trade-off is the CPU uh, overhead that this will um, generate. Um, a couple more things I think it's really worthwhile to mention. They're not necessarily something I can show in, in the UI, but I really wanted to showcase a couple of cool stuff um, that you will probably be able to see in the, when, when the first patch comes out. So let me, let me share this screen here. So unfortunately, I tried to work with the business unit to try to get a, a sample patch, a beta patch, uh, to upload into my um, FMC 6.6, .6, and unfortunately they didn't have one for me to, to be able to leverage. But one of the cool things that uh, now we can do starting with 6.6.01 is with the, when, when the first patch comes out, instead of having all these patches be pushed by the FMC, I can copy that patch into a local server and reference that server via URL. So think of the benefit. I've got branch sites. I don't, I don't necessarily want to push the patch or the upgrade over that WAN, over that link. So I can stage a local server. I could place that patch or that file locally, and when I'm pushing it to that one firewall or firewalls in that branch site, instead of saying push it from uh, the FMC, I can say, you know what, let's go ahead and push it from this web server, and then it's going to locally go to that server and upload the file and, and install the file locally. So this eliminates me having to push all these uh, images across lands or WANs uh, for uh, uh, branch sites, remote sites. So to me, I really wanted to showcase this, but uh, uh, the BU came back to me and said, can you push this WebEx a month and we'll have a patch? And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, my, my uh, uh, close friends that registered are not going to wait a month to, to see this. So uh, we'll, we'll move forward and we'll just simply show um, the slide as opposed to be able to demo that. But that's the only slide that I was not able to, uh, a feature that I was not able to showcase this and demo that, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, through the slide. With that, it's about 10 minutes to the top of the hour. Um, I've presented the 6.6 six features that I thought were cool, that I thought uh, we can demonstrate. Um, hopefully it's been a great use of your time. With that, I'll be quiet and open it up for any questions that you guys may have. When do you post the recording? Um, probably sometime over the weekend or early next week. So this will be shared on YouTube. Uh, let, me, let me put this here one more time. Uh, for anyone who missed this, um, uh, if you go to YouTube, there's a channel called The Power of Firepower. That is my channel. Uh, if you see the red F40, you've got the right right place. You hit the right place. Um, that's where all this and previous recordings are posted. And if you subscribe, you will get notified when uh, that uh, video has been uploaded. Yeah, if anybody has a question, if you would, raise your hand, and I will go and unmute you. I'm going to stop sharing off the screen. So, uh, guys, how how was the content? Uh, informational, useful? Did you guys um, uh, any value behind what we saw today? If if you did, please give us a uh, a smiley face or a, you know, if you look at the bottom of the of the participants panel, there's uh, all these different icons. You can smile or you can. Uh, uh, put a coffee cup or whatever. You can, you know, put a couple of hands that applaud or, or whatever. Uh, useful information. I'm seeing a whole bunch of applause and smiley faces. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see I've got a good friend, Eric, Mr. Uh, Eric um, Albritton. Uh, hopefully that's how you – I don't want to – Mispronounce your, your your name, but uh, I got your email, and I will uh, respond to you. Or better yet, I can give you a call afterwards. Any pending questions? Anything worthwhile to 
um, bring up. And again, as Ryan stated, I uh, thank you for being here. If you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand. There's a little emoticon. You click on it, and it puts your, your hand up. So Ryan, Paul, maybe we can. Hand raised. You have <laughs> a question, Paul? Yeah, I was demonstrating how to do that, but I do have a question. <laughs> when are we going to be able to resume our lives? Yeah. Million dollar question, right there. It is. It is. Uh, maybe we can go ahead and stop the recording at this point, Ryan. All right, you got it. Um. Ryan, Jamie, Marshall, Ned, Tom, uh, a thousand.